tap it again, there's a picture that comes with it. Or a couple pictures. that's long enough should i move on for you has everybody got at least english 1706 20 is pretty early to start although that is kind of sad it's started on gravestones and not printing but Education. I couldn't find a lot on his education, but I did find that he was a teacher and he practiced a little bit of printing in Birmingham, England. His influence in his first work, the Virgil, published in 1757, he used Royal Quarto. His typefaces used modern pseudo-classic style with level serifs and emphasis on, well, I guess that's not really an influence, but I couldn't find a lot on his influences. But um, I did, like, when I tried to find influences, I did find, like, people that he influenced. So I don't know if that would count. I put that in there in some of my other slides, though. So. Yeah, that's going to be on a later Early slide. Career. At, 17, <clears throat> at 17, he started engraving tombstones. At 20, he was teaching writing, bookkeeping, and running an engraving business. Okay. Well, for everybody... In this, I'm sure, but summarize, abbreviate, do what you need. Um, you might put Royal Quattro, that would be the name of a font as opposed to a person. And modern for him is not our idea of modern. Okay, in the uh, first century, modern usually refers to. Uh, the first 50 years of the 20th century. But what that means is pseudo means not really. Another way to think of pseudo is fake. But um, classic means it's been around since the Romans. Right? So what she found on whatever website she found this <clears throat> is that the serifs that he started using um, were, were a little bit different than the original ones that instead of using royal quattro he started making stuff that had more of a contrast between thick to thin and what a serif is well you're looking at serif font what a serif is are these little tails these little feet on every single letter and uh, those of you that have had uh, your book in that a little bit before so that's interesting so um I don't have it handy. I should have looked ahead of time at, at uh, <clears throat> Jennifer's slideshow, and I could have brought out a chisel for you from my college sculpture class when we're having to deal with with uh, stone. Basically, <clears throat> you can't write into stone and stone. the same way that you do on paper. Now, to, today you kind of probably could because I'm sure we've got either uh, etching things that would be like putting a template on there and then exposing it to acid or laser cutting. I'm sure if you go to um, some uh, memorial uh, place, I didn't know there's at least one in Denison, <clears throat> but they had to like hammer. Uh, engraving, uh, essentially what this is, is if you're gonna print, like printing books, um, you got two ways to do it. The letters might be letters that you cast in uh, metal like lead, but images, pictures, these aren't just drawings on paper because they didn't have computers that would scan them. What they had to do, <clears throat> excuse me, is the artists, the artists would have to do this in either wood or metal. And what is light would be flat, uh, a polished surface, and stuff that is dark black, you know, engraving, maybe you do know that and you're, you're mad at me for talking so much, I'm sorry, but engraving is 
actually carving or scraping away. So this has been on here for a while. We'll go back to Jennifer. <coughs> Major contributions. In this field, he became a writing master at Birmingham, and in 1740, he started a varnishing, and in other words, it was called Japanning business. The profits of that business allowed him to experiment in type pounding. Major contributions. He designed one of the most famous typefaces, improved printing press, developed a new kind of paper, and refined the quality of printing inks. So, this is the American Revolution. Here's the other thing. What do you know about Hans Gutenberg? You probably heard that in Mrs. Hazy's freshman world history class, right? You're talking 1500s. So this is a 200 year and he, you, you may not believe this, but he is making major advancements, major contributions to this thing that was already 200 years old and basically was going to go on for another 100 to 150 years, maybe, yeah, because it's only been really in the last 20 years that, uh, Newspapers and magazines have have moved away from. Okay, maybe I'm make, trying to make myself feel young. Last uh, thirty years, that magazines, newspapers, and book publishers have moved away from this kind of letterpress uh, printing. So, um, foundry, right? That's where you you melt metal and make it into machine parts or airplane wings or what have you. So type foundry that means that he's not just the printer anymore. He is coming up with, and it really kind of shows you, it's too bad now uh, that I let Callie go because photography used to be a very manual physical thing. And then you'd have to go into a dark room and use all these chemicals and you'd need to know about chemistry. Uh, and now everybody just uses their phone well, <clears throat> typography and printing, you, know, uh, you don't even need a laptop anymore. You pretty much, you can, you can blob, blog on your phone. And there are apps and uh, programs that help you, if you really wanted to, you know, scan your handwriting and turn it into a font. And we'll have a, a couple of videos this year on some typographers, which I think are much less weird and less boring. I hope that you'll feel that way than the one I showed you last week about the illustrator. But uh, it, it basically, it, he doesn't get to just do this in a sketchbook and, and on paper and then do it on a computer. This is physical labor. Okay? This is just like being a machinist, really. Um, and, and yet he's doing things that are going to to help, he's refining the chemistry of the ink. He's, it, it, well, it's just awesome, almost immeasurable. But I'll shut up. Lasting legacy slash impact. One of his biggest impacts today is the Baskerville font that a lot of people use. He influenced slash impacted the lives of many young people with a promising future. It is, um, it is a serif font. Um, question, since we all do this on Google, maybe you didn't. But uh, Jennifer, is this, is this basketball font? I use Times New Roman. Okay, which is a derivative. It, it's a... Uh, um, it's a 20th century version or update. I'll bet, I don't know for sure because I haven't read John O'Connell's John book, but I'll bet that uh, the typeface on the, this book cover, um, and maybe it's easier to compare it to your New Times Roman by looking at that one little bit that has lowercase, the confession. Uh, but yeah, you can see there's kind of a dramatic. You got, you got thick upstrokes and then into your thin um, 
Sarah. And that means nothing to you right now unless you've had your class and I gave you a, a week long unit on typography. But uh, you know what? I, it could be that typography is a little bit like opera. You either love it or you hate it. But um, we're going to have a unit on it this year. I don't know how soon, if it's a semester or if it's this quarter or last quarter, but uh, uh, change the way you look at things. If you learn to uh, just a tiny, tiny little bit. Um, all right. So tell us, what do you think about this guy and his contribution? <clears throat> Sorry, my dog was barking. But anyways, hey. my personal response. His works were sort of classic and old fashioned because not <laughs> because not many people chose on the field he went into. It may be boring to most. Um, How did he use typography? Compared <laughs> to other designs that were popular, he increased the, he increased the contrast between thick and thin pen strokes, making serif sharper and more tapered and shifted the axis of rounded letters to a more vertical position. You guys, uh, <laughs> like Jennifer says, you might find typography boring, but uh, this was revolutionary. I mean, look how clean and modern it still kind of looks. I Frankly, I think it's a better font than, uh, than the New Times Roman. Uh, what I wish that I could show you, and I'm not docking you any points for this, Jennifer, like you would know, uh, is to see some of the fonts that they used before this. Okay. Um, really, they were like <laughs> the same fonts for almost 200 years, you know, so that's like they're stuck in the Renaissance or stuck in the Mid Ages, Middle Ages, that old English. And this is cleaned up, it looks less like calligraphy. It, it looks more more machined, more precise. It was easier to read. This guy was, was revolutionary. Sweet. Wow. Decent job. Now, I don't seem to have anybody else in the waiting room. I keep hoping that maybe Reagan is one of those that is actually sick. Okay. Um, well, let me... Uh, Lucy's still not here, huh? Last I looked at Lucy, she's got some information, but she doesn't have any pictures or anything. Um, so I'm guess I'm gonna go ahead and uh, bad thing for you is that I'm doing the talking instead of the of of Reagan. Um, but the good news is that you you'll have this. Mm, kind of struggling with whether or not to uh, have this quiz tomorrow or put it off until Thursday or Friday. Wait until after I get to uh, Reagan's presentation and maybe I'll take some input or vote. Um, but uh, this is the guy that you know, okay? Uh, some of you might have even taught you about him in like eighth grade art. A lot of times at Thanksgiving, I like to use his uh, four freedoms posters. One of those four is like hugely Thanksgiving thing because people are eating. Um, you're probably familiar with his work. You've seen it around or else you've seen people that they don't really um, um, parody him or make fun of him. What, what they do is they imitate him oh, you, to this day. So especially um, uh, magazine Saturday Evening Post. I'm not even sure if it's still around. Uh, and um, I don't know, Reader's Digest used to like that kind of thing and uh, Farmer's Almanac. <clears throat> you know, and, and you're probably also familiar with, uh, as soon as I want to um, use the guy's name, I forget it. Uh, at any rate, there's artists around that are working today in the 21st century that are kind of similar. Okay, so skinny little dude. February 3rd, uh, his birthday's coming up if you want to celebrate, right? All you really need for your notes is 1894 to 1978. Illustrator. 
This is uh, going to be really different than uh, the uh, Oma or Bo whatever his name was, the illustrator that we, the Israeli illustrator that we learned about yesterday. Uh, <clears throat> you, you might call him um, an American classic. Uh, you, you might say that he's kind of a part of Americana. But have a career lasted from 1916, like during World War One. 1978, post Watergate, post Vietnam, uh, pretty phenomenal, and he's pretty prolific too. <clears throat> so let's see what she's doing for us. Uh, so the way that maybe you, if you're gonna uh, summarize or highlight or or abbreviate, is um, Something like this. Um, attended New York School of Art. Okay. And let's say that that's kind of like college. It's like getting your bachelor's. But he left that school to study at the National Academy of Design. So that's still kind of bachelor level. Uh, but then eventually got into the Art Students League. Um you know, I, I bet that there's still a New York School of Art. If there is still a National Academy of Design, I bet they've changed their name. Uh, but the Art Students League, I don't know if they're still around, but they were really prestigious. They were like a, a Yale or Harvard. Okay. Now, I was familiar because... Uh, and it might be the year that I have a copy of it is, is one of the last years that he did it. Uh, my dad probably wasn't in the scouts any longer than me, like, he, like a year or two. We're not Eagle Scouts or anything. But um, my dad was too young to fight in World War II. And uh, so he was in high school, basically, during World War II. So I don't know if it would have been junior high or freshman year in high school. He's got uh, your scouts manual. Right. And um, I don't have any copies of Boys Life magazine, but that was a magazine produced by the scouts. I know if you really are interested, talk to Mr. Uh, Hessman because he's actually a scout leader. But so it was illustrated. I have like a 1943 edition. So just before World War II. Um, and that's where he got to start. So maybe if you haven't written a bunch of stuff already, the two things that you want to write are um, uh, Art Students League and then um, Art Director, not just the Illustrator, but Art Director for Boys Life Magazine. And if you're one who annotates notes, you know, I know I'm asking you to do more, but I'm saying don't do all of this. Just do Art Students League and Boys Life Magazine. But if you're going to add something, Boys Life Magazine is the official magazine of Boy Scouts of America. Okay, so BSA. Have I had it up here long enough? You're going to have to either unmute yourself or say something in chat if you want me to wait. But I know that I go too slow and I talk too much, so you probably want me to go on. Okay. Well, I love this. And <laughs> maybe, is I didn't see a sophomore. Maybe she's remembering uh, me having taught her about it in eighth grade because three of the four pictures she's got on here are uh, from the four, uh, four freedom series. <coughs> uh, but yeah, she's probably right. Uh, because magazines, in a way, in a way for a lot of people were more like uh, the the Facebook or Twitter are today or television was when I was your age <clears throat> than radio. You know, because uh, magazines were, were pretty common. It wasn't just something that was in your dentist's office or your hair salon uh, waiting room. <laughs> and uh, whether it's illustrating a story on the inside or illustrating the cover on the front, <clears throat> excuse me it's kind of pop art before the pop art movement yeah so pop art was really 
something that started maybe about time as rock and roll in the late 50s and then moved through the 60s but not as a movement but 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 as a thing you know there's you think of fine art as stuff that you're going to see in a gallery or a museum but not everybody's going to go to museums but almost everybody nowadays everybody's online but you know during you know 1916 to 1978 I, <laughs> everybody has got their own different subscription to magazines and life before time newsweek and us news and world report uh life was probably the biggest and uh, uh saturday evening post was really probably the second biggest okay uh there's one called look you know kind of really creative names huh but so he was showing he would show um uh kids hanging out in the malt shop in the 50s uh, which they also did in the 20s and 30s by the way they would show um people working on their car working on their tractor um in the late 40s he would show the homecoming to kids who had served being welcomed back from the war by their neighborhood or their family now uh it was slice of life and if you've ever been in before it closed down thanks to like if you've ever been in uh Crocs cafe in Denison, they had lots of posters norman rockwell um interesting stuff oh but things changed just as our society changes and popular opinion changes call it the zeitgeist or the spirit of the day whatever you want to call it uh i think he really changed um and after he saw this is not even martin luther king jr this is um really i think the picture that you're looking at is ruby is it ruby ridges um <clears throat> after the um brown versus board of topeka uh education in 1954 when he started seeing how americans treated other americans uh you kind of before what we think of as the civil rights movement in the 60s uh, as it first started up the montgomery bus boycott uh, and Brown versus Board and um, the NAACP. Great movie that, um, oh, that actor that played King Chaka or whatever in uh, uh, the Black Panther is in, <clears throat> is called Marshall. And, uh, you know, if you're just flipping through Netflix, you, you might think it's like, we are Marshall, like it's about a town or a football team. Uh, but it was about Thurgood Marshall, who was a, a black lawyer that was fighting for uh, against discrimination and segregation. Well, anyway, so this skinny old white conservative guy from New England, Norman Rockwell, saw the hate, saw people throwing rocks and mud clots and, and uh, vegetables at a little kid who's just trying to go to school. And it has to be protected by federal agents. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, so he kind of started changing what his idea of Americana wasn't uh, all white Americana anymore. And he kind of um, had a had an impact, uh, I think, I don't know how huge, but I think that some of, of that uh, helped him gain respect not just as an illustrator, <clears throat> which unfortunately, uh, you know, people don't always take commercial art as seriously as they do fine art. So instead of thinking of him uh, up there with Picasso and Matisse and Rembrandt and uh, whoever, oh, he's just some hack that does stuff for magazine covers. Well, <clears throat> when he started injecting politics, uh, he really, some people started hate him as you can imagine, um, we're living through that kind of a thing right now where we're really, and I think some of the problem <clears throat> is uh, white people don't want to be accused of being racist. And, and so we, we get wounded and defensive 
And that is where a lot of the tension between Democrat and Republican or conservative and liberal are. Because, you know, quite frankly, even in the Trump era, I think that 70% of Americans pretty much are in the middle. And, and neither of us are all that extreme. But uh, this issue of race hasn't gone away. It's still an issue. Uh, this is what Reagan tells us. Oh, I love how she, what a big variety she's given us because she hasn't just got uh, shown us some of those four freedoms or <coughs> of uh, his, his <coughs> excuse me, his kind of political and, and uh, uh, so pro-civil rights stuff late in his life. But yeah, that's just kidding. Like that. that's, Sorry. He does the little kid stuff too. Yeah, so, okay. Anyway, so she really likes it. I don't, my wife, I don't know when she got this. Maybe it's for confirmation. Uh, my in-laws gave her a copy of this. Uh, I've seen doctors and cops and firemen and all kinds of people that have uh, this in their offices. And now, oh, look, I'm missing a tooth. So anyway, uh, that's it. I'll, I'll record this and like I uh, did yesterday. Um, Maybe I should show you that quick uh, before I let you log off. Is uh, go in here. <clears throat> if you weren't here yesterday, here's yesterday's meeting. Um, I also gave you a link to Jeff uh, and Julia's slideshow, so I'll do that for Reagan and uh, and Jennifer. Uh, but it's Tuesday these down on Thursday and the quiz is Friday. Can I see yeah I think at the beginning I was asking you I was gonna ask you guys if you thought you wanted to have the quiz um, tomorrow when we come back or if we should put it off. Yeah uh, which would so let's hear from you. Are you up for it? Do you have it since it's open notes anyway? Do you just want to take it tomorrow like I had originally planned? Or like I was talking in yesterday, should we have the quiz on Friday? Rumor going around that we might be on Zoom again tomorrow. You said that? Was that um break? I say we just no. don't take it. After Friday? Is that what I'm hearing? Saturday, yeah. Oh, it's going to be Saturday. I'll take it Saturday. Everybody, everybody go in the chat. Saturday. Wednesday or Friday. Smart Alec can say. Friday. Friday. Sunday, actually. Sunday. Jesse, you're both saying. Sunday for sure. Mm -hmm. All right, I meant this to be not to her. Everybody, whatever. So I'm not hearing from the girls. I'm assuming that uh, extension is the same as. There we go. Okay. That's fine. Friday. Friday. So what do we got here? Uh, we're done at 11.15, and I got 10.19. Oh, that's not right. We're done at 10.27, and it's 10.19. So you can go ahead and log out. I'm, I'm going to end this meeting. What time What time does the last class start? Uh, ninth next hour. Next, next, next class. Well, oh, the next class for me. Next class starts at 10.30. Next hour starts at 2.35. Mr. Rasamli uh, wanted us to remind you that I believe all of the teachers we have the visual in our Schoology's just got to search for them. Wait, uh, so masks are required now? And yeah, I'm glad you, if you hadn't heard that in the last two hours or you got a text, the school board has said, I believe for the next 60 days, just wear a mask. Why we haven't been able to say that to you because Maybe 
Crawford and Monona have in Harrison County, their board of supervisors want everybody wearing a mask in public. I, I suppose we're, we're afraid of the governor. But yeah, please. Just for sake of reducing the spread, especially since um, a lot of medical professionals are saying that that new English, new British strain that uh, doesn't need six feet, it needs 35 feet uh, is, is not here, it's on its way. So that's probably a good, wise choice anyway. All right, we'll see you back on campus tomorrow. All right, have a good one. How many times do I gotta end it for it to actually end? <laughs>